Joining me today, we have Mike Ruska, President and CEO of Problem Solutions, and Dr. Christina Bars, Chief Transformation Officer from Problem Solutions. And they are going to show us how to create a strategy for AI and change management. So without further ado, Mike and Christina, I will let you take over. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining Mike and myself for our AI change management transforming FOMO into an actionable strategy. So our learning objectives for today, thank you so much for joining us for this wild ride that we call AI. It all started about a year ago, November 2022, this really accelerated pace where ChatGPT just had its first birthday. I had a little birthday cap on it, and I hope that you wished it a happy birthday. I did. So let's talk about our three learning objectives for today. One, understand the essential role of change management, fostering an AI-ready culture, emphasizing skills development, mind shift, and continuous learning. Two, identifying key strategies to mitigate resistance and enhance engagement among employees facing an AI integration. And three, develop actionable strategies to make sure your team feels empowered and confident in the face of AI advancements. So I'm going to turn this over to Mike, my colleague. Mike? Yeah, it sounds great. Thanks, Christina. So you know, bottom line up front, you, know, you could think about AI as a thing, but if we just rewind and maybe think about it for a second as just really good software that gives us the ability to start to think about this in maybe not such a challenging or complex way. And if we think about it as just really good software, if we find a way to take AI and position it with both individuals and teams in our organization, you might consider that the idea that we're augmenting the intelligence of the organization. And if we augment the intelligence of an organization, we're really augmenting the enterprise that's there. And so what is in front of us as organizations uh, is two big things because the technology as demonstrated today can you know, replace up to 50% of the tasks that people might do which means we can augment humans, we can be more efficient, more effective, but also have workplace happiness and unlock this vibrant and adaptive um, in, environment. And something that you know we talk about uh, known as collective intelligence. So what, what's all the intelligence in our organization and how, do, how does knowledge flow and create value? Uh, using AI, um, augmenting teams with AI, we can make better decisions. Um, we can automate routine tasks along the way. One of the reasons that I, I think this is such an important uh, sort of shift, and Christina, would you mind going back one slide? There you go. Thank you. Such an important shift. You know, think about this. When we discovered electricity, because we didn't invent it, we discovered it as a, as a potential within uh, our universe, we had to build transmission and distribution and generation, and you know, it took a long time to build that. Think about the same thing with telegraph. When we developed uh, telegraph capabilities, we had to run a bunch of wires everywhere. When we got mobile phones, we had to go out and find all these rare earth materials and bring them together in factories and, and then to ship these things all over the world. Thing is with AI though, all the infrastructure to distribute it is already here. And the infrastructure required to make it is smarter and faster because of AI itself. So we're really, really looking at an exponentially exponential um, sort of rollout for you know, the way that AI is going to intersect our world, which means if we thought change was hard before, the speed of change is gonna be even more and the considerations for change management for AI need to be even more impactful. Um, Kai-Fu Lee, the chairman of Cinnovation Ventures uh, said this, and you know, I think you know, some people talk about job replacement, but we really talk about workplace happiness. You know, humans want and need more time to interact with each other. It could be replacing some routine jobs, but there's an opportunity to create more humanistic you know, service jobs. We've seen this ourselves inside our own organization. We, we have taken the journey since December of last year to install and build because we're both a consulting firm and an engineering firm. So we built AI agents that serve our team uh, so that we can work more efficiently, effectively, and have a more humanistic um, experience together as, as workmates.
So there's a bunch of different things that you can use AI for um, in an organization. This list is is pretty large, but may there may be things beyond this. But one of the things being learning professionals is you know revolutionizing learning experiences. I just saw a recent piece uh, from Elliot Maisie that you know he was talking about a lot of people are using AI to try to develop learning, but how are we using AI to manage the learning? How are we using AI to adapt the learning? So there's a lot of opportunity there. Certainly on the customer experience side in your organizations, I'm sure you'll all have customers if you're an organization you serve people. So that could be through support or adaptation or you know even metahumans. Um, and then you know thinking about internal productivity. Uh, whether you're creating content or automating tasks. But there's an impact for knowledge and expertise. There's opportunities to drive growth and innovation. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, no one is likely in a market where, the only per- where they're the only person serving that market. And so you've got to consider in your management team and leadership team have to consider that your competitors are probably doing something too. I hope that they don't maybe have a better sales or better CX experience because you know, there's going to be significant market shifts. Uh, that, that are coming up uh, in the future. And then we talk about AI serving individuals and teams, but you can think about AI serving one organization to another in terms of supply chain management as well. So uh, really super interested because there's so many tools that are out there uh, that you can play with and there's so many emerging things. If you guys wouldn't mind, uh, throw in the chat some stuff that you're playing with. Maybe you'll list something that someone else hasn't seen before. Uh, maybe you'll find something that someone else shares that you can find interesting. But uh, I'll, I'll give you a cue here. If you take this link, uh, bit.ly slash AI toolbox, and that's capital A, capital I, this is a link to uh, AI Daddy's 600 tools. And so there's a tool for everything. And they're all categorized by what I, what I would say is the genus of what they are, whether it's audio or video uh, or image or text-based tools. And that list is con- you know, consistently updated and it's a, it's a great spot. Uh, I'll, throw a, I'll throw another uh, link in the chat in a, in a little bit here. For, there's an AI for that. Um, and it's really interesting um, because it uses AI to search out all the AI tools that are out there. And then it uses AI to look at the Department of Labor jobs and tasks that are out there. And then it maps the AI tools to the jobs and tasks. So really cool thing to check out. Um, it's on their, the job index. Um, there is an AI for that. We have a couple responses to your question. People playing around with Bing and Cactus, different tools. Oh, cool. Very cool. Well, I... I'm barred. Yeah, the, the good thing is there's so many, there's so many to play with. The bad thing is there's so many to play with, right? I, you know, I I spend 15 minutes at minimum a day in, in a sandbox trying to play with something, trying to build something. And I, you know, this will come at, at the tail end, but we've got to be curious lifelong learners here and we've got to be early adopters because us in learning and development are the people that have the greatest opportunity to bring these technologies into our organization. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, there's this idea of using AI to augment individuals and teams. And if we do that well, uh, we can become what we would call an augmented uh, enterprise. And what that means you know, is that we're an adaptive learning organization. Not that we use adaptive learning systems, it's that our learning organization is connected to our broader organization and we're able to sense and augment what we do inside of our organization in response to market conditions. We're able to do this effectively well because we have learning ecosystems thinking. We think about people, process, technology, measurement, and analytics and experience being aligned highly uh, with the the business strategy. If If we have that thinking and we can build out augmented intelligence teams, the idea is that we can truly unlock the collective intelligence of our organization so that people know enough of the right things that they need to know when they need to know them and people become aware of new knowledge in meaningful ways and can build that uh, into their practice. Oh, TRIA, mid journey, open art. All right, we got some power users here. That's great, awesome. So, you know, the way that to unpack this idea of an augmented enterprise and kind of like a simple version is you have your version of your real org chart with real people. But as you build AI, you're essentially building a virtual org chart. That virtual org chart, one agent may serve many people in the organization, um, or an agent may serve a a number of people and communicate with another agent to communicate back 
to a number of other people. But this idea of the virtual org chart is uh, an easy way to think about this and communicate uh, you know, with your leadership teams and, and, and the business itself to say, how could we augment the people that we have? Where are the pains? You know, where are the gains that could be, that could happen? Where where are the tasks that we do that could be automated in some ways to un unlock you know more collective intelligence inside of our organization? So, I, like and like any nerdy designer, I always like to ask HMW questions, which means how might we questions. So these are some that you might be considering in your journey. You know, how might we upskill people? I and mean, this is the challenge that we have. We might think about it as ever boarding, but uh, now we have new stuff. We gotta, we've got to upskill them to leverage AI. Another challenge is you could do a lot of things, a lot of places, what is worth doing? What use cases might be out there that if you did those use cases could be impactful for your organization? And what are the proofs of concept you would use to build and how, and how might you scale them? There are opportunities to improve process and tools, prepare people and the culture, which is part of the change management journey. But you also have some considerations for security and privacy. But at the end of the day, it's really about amplifying the performance by building augmented intelligence teams. And Christina, with that, I pass it back to you. Thanks, Mike. And uh, just as a heads up, I can't see the chat because I'm presenting. So when I ask um, the questions in the chat, I'll need somebody to share those with me. Thank you. So change management is really change leadership when it comes to AI integration into the organization. What I like to think about in um, doing something that's across an entire enterprise is using Drucker's approach of leading self, leading teams, and leading organizations. Any type of effective change management begins with acknowledging what you have a sphere of control as opposed to sphere of influence. So what we're going to do in each one of these sections of leading self, leading teams, and leading organizations is talk about a little bit about what the insights are happening out in the great world of AI, and then an actionable strategy to help you, your teams, and your organizations through change management. Obviously, for each one of these sections, self, team, and organization, we could do multiple webinars on. But we're hoping that this will create that foundation to have you feel comfortable and moving you out of FOMO. And with that said, what is your fear of missing out with AI? Please answer in the chat. Give everyone a couple seconds to get their typing fingers warmed up. Uh, fear of falling behind the pack. I think that's probably a pretty common one. Another one, falling behind with technology in my profession. Figuring out the best tools out of so many choices. It does feel like, you know, ChatGPT came out and then suddenly there were 15 more. Every time I sit on one of these webinars, I learn about a new tool. Not having a strategy that promotes a growth mindset among our team. Missing out on opportunities that others are gaining. The, the website that Mike shared about there's an AI tool for that is phenomenal. I highly recommend that because it gives you that opportunity to get the right tool for the right time for the right activity. And again, as you stated, having that growth mindset, in order to have a growth mindset, you have to feel psychologically safe and creating that psychologically safe space for people willing to take risks and explore and feel safe being curious. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more in the um, in the presentation. I saw the numbers change just a little bit more. Stephanie, were there a couple of other? Yeah, let's see, we've got a few more. Fear of losing employees. Uh, fear of becoming too reliant on AI, sort of the opposite spectrum. And missing out on the future, yeah. Um, I'd say the, the majority are worried about the missing out on opportunities and you know other people taking advantage of AI when you're not. Fear of becoming a relic. 
ooh, ouch. <laughs> <laughs> But realistic, right? In talking about, um, and when it's moving so fast, you want to be able to be on that cutting edge, but not fall off. Uh, We're going to talk a little bit more about that. In fact, what we're going to talk about is how do we change fear of missing out, FOMO, to joy of leaning in to artificial intelligence and how we're utilizing it in our workspace. It's talking about upskilling and knowledge building from um, data, analytics, ethics and equity, change management, AI literacy, and workforce trends. Mike touched on a lot of this earlier in the presentation, but this gives us an understanding on how we can lean in to understand that it is, and feeling overwhelmed is okay. It's a lot. And just when you think that you have a handle on what's happening, it shifts again. So having grace with yourself and forgiveness with yourself and your team as you go through this very dynamic time. The, I think, Mike, when was the last time there was such a big change in the economy um, similar to what we're going through right now? I mean, I have to say, like, you know, dot com was a radical transformation because, you know, suddenly the yellow pages, you know, and, and uh, brochures weren't enough. Everybody suddenly needed a digital presence. And there are flocks of people that move to providing that digital presence. And then what used to be traditional software then started to get exposed, you know, through the web. I mean, that that's a massive transformation. And looking back, you know, I, I think the movement from horses to cars was a really big transformation. And it, it, look, new a ton of net new jobs were created and you know at the at the end of the day. Um and we're It's estimated that uh, some 80 million jobs will disappear, but some 93 million jobs will be introduced but they require a different skill set. You know, can we make a, a bank teller job that might be going away into a fintech engineer? I don't know, but that's what we're going to be challenged with in learning and development is, is this you know, cross-skilling people and upskilling. And that goes right into our next slide, which is how might AI impact talent care um, careers? So 50, um, these are um, some stats From recent uh, surveys, 59% of workers prefer to see an instructor rather than an AI direct their workforce development learning. That was from Wiley. Wiley uh, interviewed over or had a survey of over 3,000 respondents in 2023. Another one from that same uh, survey was 87% workers want their L&D content to be developed by a subject matter expert, not AI technology. And then another was 66% of L&D professionals surveyed agreed that using AI for administrative tasks will increase efficiency. And 84% of respondents expect the changes AI brings to be positive, but the continuing role of human leaders in AI oversight is critical. And that's from Dale Carnegie in 2021. That was a survey of 3,500 CEO all the way to individual contributors globally. Now, what does this tell us? It tells us that it's important to have computers in the group, but humans in the loop. That as we've been moving towards more of a human-centric workforce, What AI does is remove those administrative tasks to open our capacity to be able to be more strategic, to have more meaningful conversations and connections with others. So in understanding how we can, as we say, what we can influence versus what we're concerned about, what we can influence in the workspace. So what's an actionable strategy for an individual, myself, like what can I do? What can I control? And that is upskilling with prompt engineering. Prompt engineering is the is the love language of a large ma- uh, language models. It is the way that we are wow. able to uh, utilize utilize um, uh, Chat GPT and other um, AI in the workplace. But being able to understand how to use prompt engineering in an effective manner can give you the opportunity to open that capacity. Or um, Later, we'll talk about AI adjacent employees where you work, um, you have your skill set, but you're working adjacent with AI or augmented by AI. By having that prompt engineering as a leader, you're able to give guidance to others through prompt engineering. For example, I'm currently working with a, a 
talent acquisition team. And we did a prompt engineering boot camp and talking about how, no, your job is not going to be replaced by, by, by AI. It will be replaced by somebody who uses AI. So as we went through and, and talked about how you craft your prompts, how you're able to identify and identify to make sure that you do not have bias in your conversations, that you have the appropriate tone, that you're um, onboarding or job descriptions or scorecards or whatever way that you can, things that would take multiple hours, now you can compress. And when you get that input coming back out of AI, you're able to then take, again, humans um, in the loop is being able to modify it, make sure the right voice is there and to utilize it. And it's been amazing because it's been very empowering for that particular team to utilize that. But having the skill set myself as a leader, being able to coach others was really tremendously helpful. So let's talk about teams and augmented intelligence teams. And Mike, feel free to jump in on this one. Um, on augmented intelligence teams, as I said, it's the person that you're working and you're adjacent to having AI or AI is part of your team. It's thinking of humans and automation together. Um, and to what to think about is that Earl is to take and to expect that you're going to deconstruct the jobs, analyze, parse out what can be done and automated, and then what can be best um, by a human, and then reconstruct those roles. Um, Mike, would you like to add on that? Yes, absolutely. So, uh, you know, I'll add with a, a pragmatic example. I was doing a workshop for a major manufacturer. There were 27 people in the, in the workshop. We were talking about the models of augmented enterprises, collective intelligence, and the idea of augmented intelligence teams. And they had a silent writing exercise that they were doing, which is why AI, hopeful outcomes and metrics, because they matter. If, we're, if we want to use something and we believe that it's going to have some impact, we should have some way to measure it. And so after everyone got in the context, they had uh, breakout groups um, over lunch. And I sent out four different groups of the 27 people. By the way, out of the 27 people at this organization, only three of them had ever used an AI tool in their life before. So it's fascinating. So I went to one of the teams and I was monitoring all of them, but I saw two people looking at each other, looking at their phones, excitedly talking back and forth. And I said, what are, what are you guys doing? And they said, we're using ChatGPT. I said, that's cool. How are you using it? And they said, we asked it to give us ideas for AI and manufacturing. And I said, that's cool. Let's scratch that. Let's start over. Let's pretend a 20-year-old intern named Sam just walked into the room. Sam knows a lot about a lot of stuff, but Sam doesn't know anything about you. Let's tell Sam who you are and what you're doing. Tell Sam your names, your degrees, your positions within the company, and tell Sam that you're in a mission right now to determine the future of AI potentials and manufacturing at your organization and ask Sam to ask you questions. That's it. Don't, don't look for ideas from Sam because all the ideas are in, in you. Let's use Sam to augment the intelligence of your team. So I went around and seated all four groups. One hour, they all came back. We cross-briefed and at the checkout for the end of the day, People consistently said things like, we did more in this workshop to think about the future of this company than I've ever done since I've been working here or in the last three years or in the last three days at our strategic planning session, because we augmented the intelligence of the teams just with the power of asking simple questions. So there are tons of other use cases, but that's a really simple one that's highly impactful out of the game. Thank you, Mike. I'm going to just pull more, even go take that. And we push have a couple more. questions. Yep if we wanna answer them before we move on quickly. Yeah. In the example that you mentioned, Christina, what tool was the team using to check their language? And I think that was something that, that was you built custom for them, right? No, actually they were using ChatGPT with, um, with specific prompts. So you can write an email and then put the email into ChatGPT and ask it to check for tone, check for systemic racism, check for bias, and there's ways to write your prompt that when it comes out, you can ask it to check for it and just edit and then just spits it out. And that's my technical term of spit it out. Or what you can do is say bold changes and then step-by-step -step explain what you did and why. And it will literally go through and edit your email and it will highlight what it changed and then explain to you. And that's how I coach this particular team to say, understand what it's what it's doing so it's now a learning you're learning in the flow of work 
So now I'm much more aware of when I'm using a passive aggressive tone in an email or that what I thought that I was not demonstrating bias, but I was. So that's what, you know, the power of prompt engineering can help you with that. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And then one, um, okay, it looks like Mike is sharing some resources, but if you want to really quickly, we have a question from Alexi, how proficient with AI does the top leadership need to be to introduce it in the company? Do they need to know everything that you all know, or do they just kind of need a more high level concept of it? You know, think about it. Think about it. Uh, how much does the president of the United States need to know about rocket science? They need to know that we can launch a rocket into space and we can do it safely. So just take that down to the organizational level. There's a new technology. We can call it AI. It's just really good software. Where can we use this really good software? And what are what are the what's the context associated with it? Like, what do we need to consider? Security, governance, change management. Just think of it as implementing new any new technology in a company. They need to know enough about what it is and broadly how it works, what I would just call technical literacy, but they don't need to be able to develop with it. I, I don't think they, they need to know. I don't think they need to be able to give a whiteboard example about how GPTs are built or how machine learning works or any of those things. It's just a matter of understanding that it's a rocket ship and it will take you from one place to another. Um, but it's fiery and could crash and could go off course. And there's a lot of things, right? How much How much does the, the first class passenger need to know about how an airplane works? They just need to know what what where they're at and what their destination is. I hope that answers your question. I think that's great. And that's all the questions in the chat right now. Thank you, Stephanie. And that's going, going into the next level of uh, teams. We started with augmented intelligence. Now going to super teams. And Mike, you want to explain a little bit more about this because you did so well in the previous slide. Oh, you know, it's all, all good. So, you know, you think about it as augmenting. So I, what, the example I talked about with the manufacturer, you know, that was that was a one time thing. But um, imagine if you had that type of partnership consistently over and over again on you know a daily or you know, multiple days a week basis with your teams where you're augmenting that team in such a way that they start to develop a much stronger relationship you know, with, with, with the AI. So we can use it to automate stuff, that's cool. But we can also then think about this idea of a super job, a job that one person couldn't do before, but suddenly is able to do because they have multiple agents as, as we like to call them versus chatbots. Because if you can tune the AI extremely well, uh, it becomes smarter enough. So you can think about it this way. I have a set of skills, but if I work with a couple pieces of AI together, I'm inheriting the skills of those. So now I'm capable of doing a super job. Um, love to do a super job, but a super job. And so if you can think about it. If I'm able to do a super job and Christina is able to do a super job, where we're doing the work of three to four people, but we're having fun, we're doing it creati creatively. When we come together, we start to form a super team. She and I and a set of agents are able to do something that 10 people couldn't do. So that's the sort of concept that you, you will think you should think is emerging, you know, over time and working towards not just creating value and, and reducing costs, but having more meaningful um, and creative work. Thank you, Mike. So hearing about all of this, so, so far we've talked about self, we've talked about teams, now talk about the types of employee resistance to these types of changes, because these sound fantastic, but sometimes we fear what we don't understand. So there's three types of um, employee resistance that have been, we've um, run across as we've been doing these AI readiness assessments, as we've been doing these AI proof of concepts uh, with different clients. Uh, one is the technological resistance, two is cultural and uh, so sociological resistance or psychosocial, and third is organizational resistance. So, you know, the first is uh, technological resistance is, you know, fear that uh, an employee may fear that they lack the skills to work with AI effectively, um, leading to resistance to perceived inadequacy. You know, one of the things that we do when we have employee engagement, just basic is making sure that people feel worthy and that they're part of a bigger picture of the organization and they have a contribution. What they may feel and fear in technology is that they're minimized with their skill set. But just like what Mike spoke about, the idea is that it's shifting from 
um, employees that are um, specialists to employees being generalists. And as a generalist, now you have this augmented intelligence that enables you to do more, to be more, and bring more to the table and more value proposition to the organization. So the first part is the technological resistance. So ensuring that they have that skill set, letting them know so that they have you have the confidence to help them build and adapt and grow within that skill set. The psychosocial resistance is resistance that comfort discomfort of change. You ever heard that phrase, change is good, you go first? That's exactly what here is that sometimes when people are pulling back, they're afraid to go on to go further. Again, am I signing uh eventually me not to have a job? And in reality, as I said earlier, when I was speaking to this particular team, it's not that AI is going to replace you. It's somebody who uses AI in a smart and effective way. And it's also helping them um, understand that you can utilize AI and still have control over your growth and your development, control over your effectiveness and optimization in your workspace. And again, that goes with being uh, transparent in the communication of AI. Um, trust and building trust in the leadership, having a clear narrative throughout the entire organization. And then also having, again, that confidence, you know, helping people understand how they connect to the overall picture of your organization. And then organization sometimes, and this happened a lot like when you're doing improvement sciences, when lean came into the uh, marketplace, people were afraid that if they continue to do continuous improvement with lean, they would lose their jobs. But in reality, what continuous improvement does was remove the errors in the workspace, opening capacity to do more work. Doing more work means more um, money, improving your bottom line. Um, and then also that operational um, or organizational resistance is not feeling like they're involved. So we're going to talk a little bit about how do we help them feel like they have a voice and they're involved and AI is not happening to them. It's happening with them. So an actionable strategy as a leader to work with your people to make sure that they feel comfortable with AI coming into the workspace is connecting the hearts and minds. I always remember, again, as we said, computers in the group, humans in the loop, is using this design thinking canvas for empathy, an empathy map. So you can see the employees in the middle, but then we ask them to go through these um, parts of what are, they, what are they saying about AI being integrated into the workplace? What do they think? How do they feel? And what are they doing? By doing that, and it's also, you can do pains and gains or strengths and weaknesses. Have that as everybody to fill that as maybe it could be a flip chart or a mural on an online board, but having them participate in that and talk through their fears will help them with their adoption and adaptation to a new way of working, a new flow of work. I'm going to transfer uh, this over to now we're thinking about organizations. So we've done self, we've done team, now we're doing organizations. And Mike, explain the AI maturity model in organizations. Yeah, I mean, so at the end of the day, um, every organization starts as reactive. We know it's a thing, but we don't know everything about it. And we hear that something flies to the moon, but I don't know what it looks like. I don't know how it does it. Um, you know, how are, how are we going to approach this? Uh, I don't know. Let's go sense and let's kind of understand the market. And then, oh, hey, Bob and, and Jill, oh, you guys are doing experiments. Show us what you're doing. Oh, cool. That's cool. But I'm not sure how that fits to our business. Um, but there's the idea that there's serious strategic value that can be gained for an organization. And there's a stepwise function that you could move, you know, from left to right. So, as you establish strategy and governance and have pilots and initiatives, you move into the emerging category of, of maturity uh, for AI, or was what we would say is as an augmented enterprise. Uh, once you have strategy and you're building things out in production environments and scaling those initiatives and, and upskilling your workforce, you're in the operational category. Um, we, I mean, we've been an augmented enterprise, I'd say since like the May-ish timeframe, um, you know, and we're moving from this operational to op uh, optimized space where you're able to continuously improve it's driving core business functions and even innovation as well. And then building new capabilities, um, inside of the organization. Uh, but this is kind of a pathway and, you know, is there an opportunity to leapfrog? May maybe if you bring in some serious, you know, expertise onto your team, 
there's the potential that you can move quickly to a strategy. You could build out quick uh, quick wins uh, or POCs inside of your environment. And I think this is the journey that everybody's on. So we think about this as like kind of five key steps. Number one, everyone needs to understand more about the technology or say the rocket ship. What, what is it? What can it do? And then there's some considerations for because one of the knee-jerk reactions from the, the uh, chief information security officers is shut it down. We don't want any IP leaks, but people still use it anyways. And there's a lot of articles about that. So really start starting to think about governance and policy kind of out of the gate in parallel with getting that technology understanding. And then really thinking about like, well, what are the user experience we could change? There's customer experience and there's employee experience. Uh, and the next thing is really saying, all right, we got to learn about this and we need to deploy this in, in, in a learning rich way in the organization, but it has to be aligned with the business strategy. So what are the KPIs that, that need to be focused on? What are the barriers? You know, How can you align the data and technology capabilities that you have? Now, in every change landscape, you're going to have your early adopters and then you're going to have your Luddites. You don't want to be a buggy whip maker in the future. So motivating and shifting mindsets is key. That's one of the reasons that Christine and I have written the articles that we shared with you and and a whole bunch more because you need not just our own voices inside our organization, but we need external factors to show that, wait, there might be another way to do this. And then the next key thing to get to is the pilot and grow. This kind of helps you get from that reactive state uh, into, into the next phase along the way, but then ultimately scaling, sustaining. And you know we didn't talk about this today and it's not the subject of it, but you might be able to build the best thing in the world but if you don't build it the right way, the cost of computing the AI may, may actually outweigh the value of what you create. So there's some real considerations here you know, in measuring the pilots that you use, not just in terms of the people impact, but the cost, because at the end of the day, there's an environmental impact from consuming electricity and AI compute consumes electricity as well. Thank you, Mike. So as we talked about those change strategies on helping people move from fear of missing out to the joy of lear of uh, leaning in. We've done, uh, we've talked about some of the really intense ways that you can make changes in your organization and also grassroots ways that you can make changes in your organization. Things that are simple to be able to connect and hold space for people so that they can start to adapt and grow. This right here is the actionable strategy for a community of practice that you can do at an organizational level. So at an organization, a community practice is really a mix of domain, community, and practice. So the uh, domain is a specific body of knowledge. Community is people sharing that information. It can be through mentorship, et cetera. And practice is thinking about what it is that specific focus. So the idea is that our community of practice started back in the 1990s, from also from technology. It was Xerox Repairmen. So the Xerox repairmen would get together and they would meet for breakfast and they would share stories of different models of Xerox uh, copiers and the challenges they had. And they were able to take people that were brand new, new novices that were in the Xerox world and bring them in very quickly into having expert technology or expert expertise because of this way of informally sharing this information, almost like a learning circle. And this is what um, a community of practice creating in your organization could be like an ERP, but it could also be something that just as a lunch and learn where people get together and they start sharing, sharing prompts, sharing what they're utilizing in their workspace, doing those types of things would help people to one, become confident one, to be able to have transparency. And then also that helps with engagement that we honor you and your knowledge. So a community of practice is an easy way to start that conversation in your organization. Mike? Yeah, absolutely. So as we look into the future, you know, we think about the, um, the, the capabilities from emerging to reactive to optimize. We think about the, the five steps, but, but our sort of first frame that we need to put around all this stuff, it has to do with what inspires us, where is the work and what do we aspire to accomplish? You know, when I, when I gave the example of the augmented intelligence teams in the workshop earlier, their silent writing exercise was why AI, hopeful outcomes and metrics. 
And that's a really good place to start uh, with your working group to start to think through that. Uh, the next things are, you know, what do we need to consider? Regulatory, compliance, security, all those things. And then what do we know that we don't know? Because we need to search that out really before we can identify what our next steps are. So the, the, you know, answering those sort of like six bucketed areas is a really good overarching frame to think about here. But then when you really start to look at your own organization or an organization that you're serving, thinking about start with start with the pains, right? What 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 do we do a lot of? What do we spend a lot of time doing? What's hard to do? And then identifying use cases, you know, within that framework. So getting those use cases down <laughs> is an important list. Um, and then identifying like, okay, what can we build really, really quickly? That's a proof of concept that would demonstrate that there's impact both on the person or team and the output. Everything you're going to do is dependent on data. Um, G Chat GPT can work great out of the gate for a whole lot of stuff. But if you're trying to build something that you know helps your salespeople better do research about your products uh, and help to position that to uh, potential customers, uh, down the road, it probably needs to know a little bit more about what you're doing. So the question is, what data do you have? What data does it need to be meaningful? And then, you know, the, the real thing is, do you have the capabilities? Do you need to partner to get the capabilities? Do you need to hire to get the capabilities? And then this gives us a really round frame that we can then start to think about, well, what is our strategy? Now, is it driven by security? Is it driven by governance? Is it driven by end user experience? Is it driven by customer experience? And then how will we think about governance? What will we tell our customers about why we use AI and how we use AI? Um, we're very upfront with folks because we're helping them implement transformation and, and readiness and implement agents that you know service their business. And we say, we, we use agents to do our jobs. You should too. Um, and then the last thing is you know investments along the way. So we started with the bluff, the bottom line up front. We're gonna end with the blab, the bottom line at bottom. You got to find a team that believes in the dream. Uh, you, you, you don't want to have uh, your, your AI search committee or, or your stakeholder group with a lot of naysayers. And if you have a big team, it's okay to have a smaller team inside your team. That's okay. And I talked about the inspiration, perspiration, aspiration, why AI, hopeful outcomes, metrics, considerations, known unknowns, next steps, use cases, POCs, data, readiness, capabilities, all of those things. Those are critically important. But once you have the team, then you can start the conversation around that frame. And then you get to find some prototypes and, and pilots. But at the end of the day, there's you've got to ride the seesaw of enterprise versus entrepreneurship, you know, in this way. So you got to try stuff, you got to break stuff and make stuff. Chris Hively said it well. Uh, he's the founder of MapQuest uh, in his book, Build the Fort. You learned everything about a new venture when you build a fort as a child. Find a team, find a shared dream, get spare parts, build something, see what works beg, borrow, and, and cut cut lawns, do whatever it takes to improve the things that don't work. So there's a very scrappy sort of entrepreneur approach. So uh, Stephanie, you, you want to maybe take this one? So in, in the spirit of the joy of leaning in, the ELB team can help you lean in hardcore. Absolutely. I love it when my presenters just queue up my little sales moment at the end. We do. We recently launched our AI services. So we help you with, we do AI consulting development training. My, uh, Mike has a little screenshot from our website and I'll put the link in there as well so you can learn more. But yes, we are here to help you raise your team's IQ, create those strategic planning things that Mike was just talking about and create and deploy solutions in your organization so that you too can become an augmented enterprise. And if you want more information about that, if you want to talk to our team, there is a contact form on that page that I just posted in the chat. Now, if we have a little bit of time. If there's any more questions, you can go ahead and put those in the chat right there while you have these two geniuses ready and waiting. Yeah, I'm flattering them so that I can convince them to come back and do more webinars. It's very <laughs> self-serving, but. Well, I, I'll say this, if, if anyone wants to wants to frame any question, we're, we're, we're glad, you know, we're glad to help. We're super excited about this space. 
Uh, this is the best time to be alive, I think, not just in terms of technology, but to be in learning and being able to assist your organization to understand. Because as a learning professional, it's not just about designing learning for the things that we do in the business. It's about designing learning for the future of what the business will be. And that, that includes education for everybody. Ronald, thank you. We greatly appreciate that. And we appreciate you all spending uh, 38 approximate human hours here with us. Human hours. Uh, can you give an example of a company who has initiated AI and the steps they took, perhaps even from your own company? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll give you the, the tale the tale of two companies, uh, one with less than 100 employees and one with almost 100,000 employees. Uh, we were the company with less than 100 employees. And so December 1st said, we're going to do this uh, and, and we're going to start building things that matter. And we said, do we, are, are we going to let security constrain us? Um, no, but we need to consider it. Um, are we going to let governance, you know, constrain us? No, we're just going to build things. Let's start prototyping and getting things out because working code trumps all theory. Um, and so we just started building things and kind of got the, the a core team on board with, both text message uh, sharing, because there's so much. You could literally spend 12 hours a day to stay on the edge of the space. And you know, I feel very lucky because we have a great, en great engineering and technology team and a great consulting team who's really partnered together about what is worth doing and how do we do it. And so you know, we took those steps along the way. I personally have 13 agents that I use on a daily basis um, along the journey. And so you know, really declaring that, this is what we want to do and, and doing it. Flip side, you know, a large organization, they're going to start with security until they have that hammered out. No one's using, no one's using anything, right? Um, and so the first steps that they take are finding a way to have private secure infrastructure. What I've seen also, and we've helped organizations do this, is while they're working on the infrastructure pieces, really starting to think about the use cases and, and the proofs concept that can be built. So by the time you have a private secure instance, that you can start to fulfill those use cases. The next step along after that is getting the information that's really relevant to your organization in there. You know, every organization has its own language. You know, and not only do we have business speak like boil the ocean and circle up on that, but we also have the language of the organization and, and words mean different things, you know, in, in, in different domains. So that's where training, fine tuning and RAG and other methodologies come in so that you can contextualize the AI. Think about it as a translator. ChatGPT or an LLM like that is a really good engine, but I need to translate the context of my world and have it do its work. Then it needs to translate that context back into my world um, as well. Uh, this is a serious partnership between the business, between technology, between learning and and um, and cyber you know, as well. So people that can collaborate really well, people that believe in the dream, uh, people that can kind of say, we can't see the whole way around the corner, but we need to do that, are going to be best positioned to take this journey. Fantastic answer. We have another question from Ronald. In this webinar, we've talked kind of a lot about more of a co corporate approach, but how does the nonprofit world fit into this? Oh, I have some thoughts on that. Christina, you probably need to, but I, I'm going to jump in first if you don't mind. So <clears throat> I do a lot of like community work here. Actually, in Western Pennsylvania, we run uh, boot camps um, for, for teaching people AI and prompt engineering, uh, boot camps for CEO roundtables to help you know executive leaders understand what rocket ships are, and they don't need to know all, all about the fuel, but we try to get some of that technology awareness. One of the groups I was working with uh, recently at a chamber of commerce I, afterwards, the whole staff, there was like five staff people, they were all in there, and they said, is AI going to take my job? And I looked at the executive director and I said, are, are, are you guys profitable as a nonprofit? Yeah. Do you guys want to do more to serve your mission? Yeah. Well, guess what? Now you can. So I think for profit companies, I hear, I hear a lot of terms thrown around like optimizing revenue per employee, which means making more money with less people or making more money with the same people or making the same money with less people. But the opportunity in the nonprofit world, I think is fascinating because now you can communicate better. Uh, there's an optimization that, that can be here with augmented intelligence teams that better serves the stakeholders that, that you serve in, in the nonprofit world. So I am very excited about what AI can do for nonprofits. 
Great, thank you. All right, so it looks like we've tackled. Oh, Christina, did you want to add anything to that? Oh, one? I, I'm just as as Mike says, I, I do a lot of work on nonprofit and also working like in the Head Start space or early childhood education space, and it's amazing using uh, AI to help build capacity and capability. When you are working on a shoestring budget, when you have constraints and you're able to um, take these types of tools and as Mike says, he has 13 agents. I have a couple in my own uh, nonprofit as well as the organization that I'm consulting with right now. And it helps us tremendously in building capacity and confidence. Because quite often when we're working with organizations, we feel like, well, we're just this little David going against the Goliath. In reality, this can be something that with the democratization of AI can level set and give nonprofits a competitive edge. Fantastic, thank you. All right, it looks like those are all the questions that we have in the chat. Mike, Christina, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing this information. It has been fantastic and very helpful. Thank you to all of our attendees for joining us this afternoon. We love spending our time with you and chatting with you. This was recorded, so you'll be getting the link in your email probably the end of today, early tomorrow. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to ELB or to Mike and Christina. Their contact info is right there. And hopefully we'll see you all on another webinar soon. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.